Christians. Mm. A very good morning to you wherever you are in St. Lucia and across the entire Eastern Caribbean. Welcome to the St. Lucia House of Assembly, where Parliament will be set in today, August 9th. The last time we were here was on the 26th of July. We will have today, as usual, statements by the ministers. Uh, papers to be laid by the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Development and Youth Economy. Uh, these uh, papers are statutory instrument number 96 of 2022, the legal profession uh, eligibility, Douglas Leonard Mendez order. Statutory instrument number 100 of 2022, the excise tax amendment schedule number one number 10 order to be laid by the honorable minister for public service home affairs labor and gender affairs statutory instrument number 97 of uh, 2022 immigration prohibited immigrant order statutory instrument number 98 of 2022 passport fees amendment regulations to be tabled by the Honorable Minister for Commerce, Manufacturing, Business Development, Cooperatives and Consumer Affairs, Statutory Instrument Number 99 of 2022, Price Control Amendment Number 12 Order. By the Honorable Minister for Finance, that's the Prime Minister, Economic Development and the Youth Economy, Income Tax Amendment for the second reading, that's bills, bills to be laid by the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Development and the Youth Economy. Income Tax Amendment for the second reading, the Public Debt Management for second reading, Security Interest in Movable Property, first reading, and for the second reading, the Special prosecutor this one now this bill will be very very interesting in today's proceedings with me at the St. Lucia House of Assembly is Mr. Michael Gasper good morning Michael good morning bonjour Monsieur Winston Springer avec Magadi bonjour bienvenue pour session mon session 9 um Kai Consigliore Mais um, comme Winston do, nous can discuter plusieurs différents sujets. Mais aujourd'hui, comme la coutume, premier bagage qui a fait, c'est um, après la prière, tout bagage comme ça. Uh, c'est ce qui a demandé n'importe quoi pour faire statement. Mais nous pensons que c'est là qu'une personne qui a fait statement, ça paraît bagage ou quoi ça d'avance. Mais après ça, au cas où ça a créé papers, c'est bien dit. Ça veut dire par document qui um, ça c'est quand qu'on s'est obligé connaître avec c'est mon qui a présenté ces papiers là pour mettre ces papiers ça sur table là pour connaître gens quand il parle connaître c'est ça c'est premier ministre là qui a discuté il y a des papiers il y a aussi un um, ministre qui est responsable des affaires publiques qui a aussi discuté des affaires ça um, c'est passeport il y a une immigration Prohibited immigration or immigrant order. Avec aussi ils ont fait passeport. Ça c'est c'est y en a ces sujets qui quand discuter tellement en pile ces jours puisque c'est un gouvernement qui allait changer pour un passeport. Neuf ça il a créé e passeport. Aussi nous gagnons ça c'est ministre qui nous est-ce que ça nous a fait comme us. On a un mari politique qui a présenté aussi un autre à ces affaires. Price I got price control amendment avec um, not by order. Aussi, nous ni um, bills assez. Nous ni un, un bill car c'est ça il va créer ces lois, ces lois qui qui entrer en pays en loi neuf. Nous ni ça il va créer income tax amendment ça c'est changement il va faire pour income tax avec aussi un lien l'autre qui va créer public debt management en anglais ça veut dire management debt gouvernement qui manière ça qui manager qui fait en loi qui passer en loi à ça avec aussi la nion l'autre pour security interest in movable property ça veut dire l'intérêt 
qui mouni pour sécurité en en propriété qui passe à sortir ça c'est qui fixé à dans une place et ben ça qui qui pas fixé on mettait comme modo ca et ben bagaille comme ça puisque pas fixé quand comme bagaille qu'on caille ça c'est ça qui fixé et aussi quand Winston Doudal ça qui est plus chaud c'est qui est plus intéressant c'est ça il a créé special prosecutor special prosecutor c'est un loi gouvernement ça l'a décidé qui y a qu'à ni pour dam pour monde qui qui enfin qui fait passe dans un gouvernement corruption et que pour investiguer ce bazar ça il s'est marqué dit nous spikage à là avec nous qui préparer pour ça présent Let us pray. Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign and princes decree justice, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we, thine unworthy servants here gathered together in thy name, do most humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above to direct and guide us in all our consultations. And grant that we, having thy fear always before our eyes, and laying aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affections, the result of all our counsels is the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the Queen, the public weal, the and the tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and living together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the state. Through Christian love and charity one towards another. Through the Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Good morning, members, and I want to apologize for the late start. I have already been berated on WhatsApp for not having a, a timely start, but members would be aware that there were some issues involving the broadcast, nothing to do with our own NTN or our internal staff, but an outside broadcast. Uh, which was not allowing for the relaying of the proceedings. That has now been remedied, so this is the reason for the late start. I want to inform members of the retirement of our long-standing and faithful clerk of parliament after more than 30 years of dedicated service to the parliament and the government and people of St. Lucia Ms. Lindell Gustav officially retired from a post as Clerk of Parliament, and I want members to join with me in showing our appreciation for all that. I also wish to advise that in the interim, the Public Service Commission has kindly consented to the appointment in an acting position of her faithful deputy, Mrs. Esmalin. Cox Jean-Louis. I have received notices from the member for Grosley and the member for Denry North that they will both be late to today's proceedings. And members, it is with sadness that I report the passing of former Speaker of the House of Assembly, Donald Alsey, who served between August 1981 and June 1982. Speaker Alce served during a difficult period in our political history with most of his tenure under the so-called interim government. I have reached out to his family 
and I've also instructed that the Parliament flag be flown at half mast on last week Friday, yesterday, and during today's sitting. And I beg to announce that His Excellency, the Acting Governor General, has been pleased to assent to the following bill, International Bank's Amendment. And I also wish to advise, belatedly of the birthday of the member for Castries Central, who celebrated last week, and on your behalf, I wish him belated birthday greetings. <laughs> Members pursuant to section 58 of the Constitution, which mandates the establishment of the Constituency Boundaries Commission, and which further allows for reports produced by the Commission to be laid in the House of Assembly, I must now report to you on the status of the last report debated by this Honorable House. As members would be aware, the cited report was unanimously adopted by every member, by every individual of the five-member commission and thereafter signed by all members. There was no dissent. The report which was thereafter debated in the House of Assembly was then legally challenged by the then MP for Castries South Southeast prior to its ascent by the Governor General. The former MP for Castries South Southeast joined the Commission, the then Prime Minister, and the then Governor General as respondents to his application and challenge. These respondents were represented by Anthony Astafan, Senior Counsel, Sidney Bennett, Queen's Counsel, and Roger Ford, Queen's Counsel, respectively. The challenge by the then MP for Castries Southeast was vigorously opposed by the respondents. However, the challenge was never determined by the, high, by the High Court for a number of reasons. Among them, one, the former MP for Castries Southeast and his legal team appeared obsessed with seeking an order to have Anthony Astafan, senior counsel, removed as counsel. Two, the elections of June 2016 and three, nothing was done for five years by the then MP and the new counsel for the commission appointed under and during the last administration to prosecute the case between the period 2016 and 2021. Following the elections of June 2016, the incoming administration promptly replaced Anthony Astafan, senior counsel, Sidney Bennett, Queen's counsel, and Roger Ford, Queen's counsel. Thereafter, Nothing was done by either of the parties, especially the claimant. In mid-2021, and prior to the general election, a suggested consent order was made by the then chairman of the Boundaries Commission and the then council who represented the commission and other parties. The consent order was placed before the High Court, indicating that the Boundaries Commission was prepared to accept an offer from the claimant to withdraw the matter if the respondents, that is the commission, the prime minister and the governor general, agreed to pay the claimant's legal cost on an indemnity basis. That consent order was vigorously opposed by two members of the commission appointed by the then leader of the opposition. The high court in its wisdom appeared to have rejected the consent order on legal and perhaps other grounds. I must, however, point out that the then chairman of the commission and the then council who represented the commission and other parties had also agreed to vacate the order of cost made in favor of the commission. So in effect, they agreed to pay for the claimant's cost, yet forgo their own costs ordered by the courts. Fast forward to the present. Following the elections of July 2021, in keeping with the Constitution of St. Lucia, a new commission was established. The two members who previously opposed the consent order during the last commission were returned, this time, as appointees of the new Prime Minister. And the commission took the decision to reinstate Anthony Astafan, senior counsel, as claimant to the commission. 
the current Attorney General and the new Commission were presented with a significant invoice for the legal fees, just shy of a million dollars, which is alleged the former Attorney General and the former Boundaries Commission had agreed to pay. Having reviewed the records and the minutes of the various meetings, the new Commission could find no compelling reasons to have agreed to pay this figure and therefore instructed its solicitors to resist the same. This included the fact that nothing was done for five years to prosecute the case, and as a result of this delay, the report is either no longer valid or alternatively of mere academic importance. The matter on a possible resolution came up for hearing on Friday the 5th of August 2022, and following arguments from both sides, the judge agreed to an adjournment to the 14th of October 2022. Meanwhile, the current commission since its appointment has attempted without success to have the former chairman meet with it in order to inquire into how it was agreed to pay the substantial figures claimed by counsel for the former member for Castries Southeast. All of our efforts have proved unsuccessful. In this connection, it is our intention to advise the Attorney General's office to proceed to the High Court to compel an attendance by the former chairman. So that's a report on where we're at. I know members, you'll also join with me in extending our heartiest congratulations to Team St. Lucia, which participated in the recently concluded Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, England, and where our very own Julian Alfred took home the silver medal in the 100 meter dash and she was second only to multiple Olympic gold medalist, Jamaican Elin thompson Hero, who clocked 10.95 seconds to Alfred's 11.01 seconds, a difference of, zero, of 0 0.06 seconds. Statement from ministers. Minister for Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, I rise to make a statement on the status of our banana industry. After one year of assuming office as Minister of Agriculture, I am pleased to provide an update on our progress. Mr. Speaker, when I last addressed this Honorable House on the status of the banana industry earlier on in May of this year, I indicated that our banana outputs over the last two to three years have plummeted to an all-time low. Let nous parler dernière fois en mai l'année ça là. Fig nous situation industry fig la terre dans mauvais mauvais condition. Trade with our UK partners had been halted as our banana industry experienced some key challenges, which included lack of supply of production inputs qu'on nous save à d'entendre nous tenons problème pour ces farmages vingt sel nous save qui manière puis sel monter faire un petit sac qui est égal pour quarante huit dollars avec un petit moment il vivait presque un cent dollars we had market inefficiencies loss of access to the UK market nous pas de gavan fig pour presque yon l'an et demi en l'Angleterre lack of financial resources to revitalize or rejuvenate banana fields. Financial crisis experienced by the NFTO, which resulted in the inability to pay for inputs, packaging materials, and other critical expenses. Winfresh had gone into administration and therefore ceased to exist from July 2019. 
the NFTO was ill-equipped to carry out the functions of Winfresh in an efficient and effective manner. And we all know the passage of Hurricane Elsa in July 2021 resulting in a loss of approximately 87% of our banana crop. Mr. Speaker, these challenges led to a direct negative impact on our banana quality and quantity. Our banana industry had collapsed, so St. Lucia was denied a 22 banana contract by Sainsbury. Mr. Speaker, while all these challenges stated previously may have suggested the end of the banana trade, our government remained focused and committed to reshaping and repositioning the banana index industry. Let nous tant tout ces bagarres qui ont été faites avec les figues là, côté monde de Gadi, nous ne pouvons jamais vivre devant les figues anglaises. Nous avons un gouvernement led by Mr. Honorable Philip J. Pierre qui était très concerné et qui nous fait tout ce que nous avons fait pour que l'industrie des figues là aille. Assuming office, upon assuming office, our government, a St. Lucia Labour Party government that seeks to put people first immediately set out to deal with the issues to restore farmer confidence and encourage farmers to replant and cultivate bananas. Mr. Speaker, in May of this year, a technical team from Prima visited St. Lucia to ascertain the state of readiness to rec re recommence trade with the UK. Our team Prima visited St. Lucia in May of this year, it was they took a point decision to commence to buy the fig from this place. After a long time, we didn't buy it from the other side. We bought 20 fig from the other side. They came to St. Lucie. They went to the market and came to the market. They came to the market and came to the market. I am pleased to report that the findings have indicated that our visited sample farms were among the highest standards and comparable to any well-kept banana farm found in other parts of the world. You know where condition fig no? And you di se plantation te adan standard kote yo kwe ki comparable comparable ek lot plus yo ka ash de fig from la terre. Mr. Speaker, it is based upon the external evaluation of the hard work of our banana farmers. Ek mouvle oui messie tout se farmers la ki pwen en, en, en décision pour produire qualité figue là plantation dans condition côté nous de ça faire prima wé n'a nous pas wé pour voyer figue vieille anglaise and the hard work of our, our banana farmers mr speaker the government the banana task force and nftu that prima was confident that we should recommence trade in the uk mr speaker i am pleased to report to this honorable house that we have Recommends the shipment of our bananas to the UK for the past nine weeks. So in the next semaine, nous commençons à voir fig vie lot pays et primer se yon se de supermarket la qui ka acheté fig from nous. Et mon vle oui merci gouvernement Saint Lucia la Bepati, mon vle oui merci cabinet la pour tout si poa nous baye se fama NFTO pour faire sa fête. To date, we are able to restore production levels back to our contractual obligations of 2,000 boxes per week as of the end of July 2022. The hard work and commitment of our farmers, field officers, government, the Banana Task Force, and the NFTU has paid off. Mr. Speaker, while we celebrate this achievement, there are still challenges facing the industry. I want to say that the government has done everything that we need to do in the industry. But we have done a lot of work in June of the past. We have done a lot of work for the government. And we will continue to work with the government to make more work. We don't want to say that we will say that we will work in France. Because we don't want to make a piece of work with the government to make a piece of work. Nous allons concentrer à Soulangliter, nous allons concentrer en Wizon, 
et que nous avons commencé à faire bon congrès à bas le gouvernement saint louis chalet Mr. Mr. Speaker, while we celebrate this achievement, there are still challenges facing the industry, as I mentioned. The UK banana market is highly competitive. Once you lose your spot on the market shelves, it becomes an uphill battle to regain that position. Farmers, we must orient our mindsets in keeping with international standards in order to gain competitive advantage. Mr. Speaker, the banana industry is significantly impacted by the, by the high fuel prices. Banana industry has faced a situation where the bateau that has been able to get the bateau has increased. That's because we need the gas to get the The cost of shipping has doubled. We are restricted by the limited shipping options available to us in the region. Mr. Speaker, on average, our bananas take approximately 21 days to reach the UK. Figla ka point presque trois semaines pour arriver l'Angleterre, while our competitors can export theirs to the UK within 12 to 18 days. The extended journey time can present quality issues for our bananas. I think that it is now time for us to explore all our shipping options in an effort to reduce cost and travel time. Mr. Speaker, on the positive side, we are extremely grateful to God for the high levels of rainfall received thus far. The much needed rainfall will help irrigate the farms and increase the yield size and quantities. The availability of fertilizer and other inputs locally will greatly assist the farmers in the, efforts, in the efforts to increase the yield size, fruit quality, and volumes. Mr. Speaker, we have estimated that the volumes will increase significantly by the end of August into the first week of September. Last month, Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity as Minister for Agriculture to meet with our UK supermarket partners, Prima and Fives who are ripening agents for Red Rose and Sainsbury supermarkets, respectively. So, I have an opportunity to engage Prima, Fives, the people who are by Red Rose and Sainsbury, to discuss what the government has done to ensure that we have a chain market for the market and to produce a fig of the highest quality. I also had the opportunity to receive and see our bananas go through the Prima ripening facility. The process was very, very meticulous. Attention to detail is of the highest level. The bananas are examined upon arrival, then they are repackaged. The defective ones are rejected and form part of a quality claim against the NFT1 farmers. The good bananas are repackaged and placed in the ripening chamber chambers for processing. Once the fruit is ripening, Mr. Speaker, they are sent to the supermarkets. Mr. Speaker, discussions with Prima, Prima were very encouraging as they in indicated that they are very pleased with the quality of the fruits they've received from St. Lucia so far. Prima, dis-moi that you're too content a quality figla Saint Lucie commence à vieillir, voyez en en l'anglité depuis mai, ju juin pour 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 Crown rot, ça c'est côté tête figue là pour oui. Sugar max, ça c'est côté c'est petit tacté à grand les figues là. Ça c'est y en a c'est de ces problèmes là y ont ni et nous qu'à quoi faire mal qu'à travailler pour faire plus mal pour résoudre ces problèmes ça là. Mr. Speaker, I was extremely pleased when the Prima Quality Control Manager, Mr. Steve Whitehouse, stated and I quote, and I quote. St. Lucia banana is one of the sweetest bananas on the market that I have tasted. Yo di fig St. Lucia, say on a say, I'm fig like it, please do. Ah, all that here. 
Ek, do consigo. Indeed, there is something unique about the taste of our bananas that we should seek to market. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> my, Mr. Speaker, my other meeting with Fives was good at increasing banana volumes into the UK via the Sainsbury supermarket chain and other prospective supermarkets which are linked to the ripening agent. Our discussion, discussions were promising but inclusive. Mr. Speaker, I was advised by, by the five representatives that they will be reporting to Sainsbury after our meeting. They indicated that they could not give a confirmed commitment at this time unless they had consulted with Sainsbury. The next steps will require a technical team from Fives and Sainsbury to visit St. Lucia, to visit our farms, the banana farms, in order to assess our state of readiness to export to Fives and Sainsbury. However, they were very happy to know that we have recommenced exporting our bananas to the UK. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank our Prime Minister, Honorable Philip J. Pierre, for his continuous support towards the banana industry and our farmers. On every occasion when I speak to the Prime Minister, he's always inqu inquiring about the status of the banana industry. He has gone further by facilitating the financial and technical support needed to revive the operations of the NFTO, including the provision of free oil to our banana farmers. And Mr. Speaker, I want to make an, an announcement right now that we will be giving a free cycle of oil to our banana farmers in the next few days. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister continues to encourage me to reach out to our, our partners in the UK as we seek to build on the successful working relationships and secure market presence. Mr. Speaker, in showing commitment to the banana industry, farmers and our society at large, a Labour Party-led government, one that puts people first, want to remind the population that bananas are widely consumed around the world. Furthermore, our farmers are amongst the best banana producer producers in the world. The taste of our bananas is the sweetest in the world, as I expressed earlier. Mr. Speaker, although some of the of the view that some of the view that the banana industry is not viable since the collapse, we have worked very hard to gain access to the UK and regional markets, giving our farmers an opportunity to trade. Today we are exporting both internationally and regionally. On the regional front, a total of 6,500 boxes of bananas are exported to Barbados, Trinidad, and Tobago, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Antigua weekly. Mr. Speaker, it's our intention to try and raise the regional threshold to 10,000 boxes per week. We must employ our best efforts to help sustain the banana trade because the industry has the potential to provide social and economic benefits for our society. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Senior Minister. Mr. Speaker, permit me to quickly 
join you in recognizing the sterling contribution made to this parliament by former clerk of parliament, Ms. Linda Gustav, who has served for many years, many a parliament in this country. I want to applaud her for her contribution to the parliament. Mr. Speaker, I present this morning a statement on the Millennium Highway and West Coast Road reconstruction project. Mr. Speaker, the Millennium Highway and West Coast Road reconstruction project represents a significant infrastructure project initiated to rehabilitate and upgrade approximately 40.2 kilometers of existing roads together with associated drainage, retaining structures, bridge replacement, road realignment, and roundabout construction. The project is funded by a grant from the United Kingdom Caribbean Infrastructure Fund, UKCIF, with counterpart funding from the government of St. Lucia. The project funding is managed through the Caribbean Development Bank, the CDB. The expected project outcomes are A, increased efficiency, resilience, and road safety of the Millennium Highway and West Coast Road, and B, improved maintenance and planning regime for the road sector in St. Lucia. The project, Mr. Speaker, the project components, Mr. Speaker, include one, project proprietary assistance, two, land acquisition, three, infrastructural works, four, engineering and construction related services, five, institutional strengthening, six, capacity building, and seven, project management services. The project's impact includes enhanced decision making capacity for planning, management and maintenance of St. Lucia's road sector, and increased efficiency, resilience and safety along the road corridor to support sustainable development. Component number one, Mr. Speaker, project proprietary assistance, focuses on consultancy services for the completion of a feasibility study to inform the final designs and bid documents. Two, land acquisition. The feasibility study undertaken informed that approximately 14,043 square meters of privately owned lands will be impacted by this road reconstruction project and required acquisition. To date, lands have been acquired at Ancillary for the resettlement of project affected persons being impacted by the reconstruction of the bridge. Vendors along the Millennium Highway have also been relocated to an area that will be developed into a rest stop and a food court soon. The government of St. Lucia is currently developing a strategic plan towards the relocation of vendors along the Marigo and Rosa road corridor into the food court and tourism rest, spot, rest stop area when that is completed. The food court and tourism rest stop area in close, is, are in close proximity to the existing highway and allows patrons and tourists to safely access these convenient facilities. Number three, infrastructure works. Mr. Speaker, the infrastructure works entail the rehabilitation and reconstruction of approximately 14.2 kilometers of existing road and the reconstruction of the ancillary bridge. The infrastructure component was originally separated into three components that were identified as lot number one, Millennium Highway to a new cul-de-sac roundabout, lot two, Cul-de-sac to Ancillary, inclusive of the reconstruction of the Ancillary Bridge, the South Southern Bridge, and Lot 3, Ancillary to the Sufra Bridge. Lot 1, Mr. Speaker, was contracted and works 
commenced on August 19, 2021, with an estimated completion time of 18 months. So it means, therefore, Mr. Speaker, six months to go, but we have seen very little movement taking place on that road, and, and I mean visible movement on the road itself. Bids for Lot 2 and 3, Mr. Speaker, were rejected, and consequently, Lots 2 and 3 were rescoped on the recommendations of the bid evaluation report. The market response, that is, bids received for Lots 2 and 3 were exorbitant and way above the budget, hence the rationale to reject all bids and rebid those components of the project. Mr. Speaker, Lot 1, Millennium Highway to Cul-de-Sac Roundabout, the new Cul-de-Sac Roundabout. Mr. Speaker, as far as it relates to Lot 1, Millennium Highway to Cul-de-Sac, the project was awarded to C.O. Williams Construction following bid evaluation and award of tender. The works to be undertaken involve the reconstruction of approximately 6.2 kilometers of the existing highway, construction of a new roundabout, which is currently being undertaken, drainage and sidewalk construction. 90% of road reclamation incorporates the concept of what is called full depth reconstruction, FDR. FDR involves the pulverization or milling or grinding of the existing road pavement structure to a certain depth to be agreed by the consultants based on the science, which is then blended with cement as a stabilizing agent to constitute the reconstruction of the pavement to the standard required. Infrastructural works on the Millennium Highway to Cul-de-Sac are ongoing, but the overall project for Lot 1 is delayed unduly due to numerous risk factors that have impacted the project. These risks, which have contributed to delays of the works, include one, shortages in key project personnel by the contractor, and that has delayed the project severely. The failure of the contractor to be able to present to the project, to present to the bank and the consultant, the competence and capacity of a project team to undertake the project, that has seriously delayed the project. Two, the negative impact caused by COVID-19 pandemic and three, the difficulties being encountered by the contractor in achieving the relevant requirements for materials as per contract specifications in a timely manner to name a few and also the breakdown of equipment. Mr. Speaker, in such a scenario, a contractor selected by the, the um, consultants or the team should have presented sufficient evidence of their ability to undertake the project in a meaningful, meaningful and um, significant manner. In this case, we have encountered the inability of the contractor to provide the competent um, personnel, and we have also encountered the contractor failing to achieve the relevant quality requirements and materials as per contract specifications. And that is an important aspect of the project. We do not go on a major project of this nature without fulfilling the requirements of the contractor to ensure that the road for which the government of the United Kingdom is gifting us meets all international standards. Notwithstanding these delays, Mr. Speaker, which I've highlighted early on, the Department of Infrastructure ports and transport has decided to work along with the engineering consultant and the contractor to implement a corrective action to the works so as to achieve the time for completion, which is very, very tight at this time. Given the delays currently being encountered and the resultant impact on the overall schedule for the delivery of the Millennium Highway to Cul-de-Sac project, the Ministry has strategically refocused the delivery of this component of the project into three subcomponents. 
Component number one, subcomponent number one, will focus on the construction of the roundabout while maintaining the quality requirements of the embankment fill. Subcomponent number two will focus on the full depth reclamation, which I mentioned early on, of the existing road pavement and its reconstruction. I'm hoping soon, Mr. Speaker, that the consultant will instruct, the con rather the, the contractor will engage himself in getting that aspect of the project going. Subcomponent number three will take into consideration ancillary works that include drainage, major culverts, sidewalks, and other road furniture. The public will notice a level of activity on subcomponent one, construction of the roundabout between the new cul-de-sac bridge built by the Japanese and the, and the Encomode Hill near the KFC. This is to construct the new approach road and embankment of the new bridge, which is due in August for completion to meet the milestone to move traffic onto that new bridge. In addition, works continue on support structures to complete the various arms of the new roundabout. Subcomponent two, roadworks between La Torque roundabout and cul-de-sac is ongoing, however, mainly behind the scenes. If you drive on this road now, you would hardly see anything happening. Um, no visible action taking place except cleaning of a shrub, and the ministry has been at the contractor to get on with it and to start work in earnest. This will entail the engineering consultant's review of the numerous contractors' documents over the, over the quarter that included the FDR mix design and concrete mix design for lot one. Within the next two weeks, Mr. Speaker, the contractor is expected to mobilize onto the roadway between the Tok and Kaldisak pavement to begin trials of the FDR. In other words, before the contractor actually commences that process of remilling the road and getting it tested in the laboratory, a trial strip will be allowed so as to test the, the material the, um, being done by the contractor. This will entail use of heavy equipment resulting in traffic disruption and delays as well as some dust nuances. Works on this subcomponent, Mr. Speaker, of the project is expected to accelerate in August 2022. Works on subcomponent number three entails thus far repairs to rubble walls and some drainage improvements. Works are ongoing and has directly impacted the road pavement, thus causing very little disruption to traffic. The public will be informed of all works, all work uh, will be informed as works progress along the roadway. Mr. Speaker, the cul-de-sac roundabout, which I spoke early on, the contractor completed the installation of a culvert along arm, what is called arm number one, opposite the KFC, which is the access to the bridge and should proceed to fill in of the road embankment to integrate the roundabout to the Mon in Commode Hill. Arm number two, which is the East Coast arm, exit, construction of the tow wall to support the road embankment is in progress and a reinforced concrete base was cast in the course of last week on the northern limit of the East Coast Road and adjacent to KFC southern boundary. The contractor is expected, Mr. Speaker, to construct the walls on the northern end of the next week, of next week, in the next week and move to constructing the walls on the southern side of the West Coast Road. Arm number three, Mr. Speaker of the Roundabout, integrates the cul-de-sac JICA funded bridge into the Roundabout. The completion of arm three is critical in the commissioning of the bridge. The contractor has developed the embankment to the level of the subgrade. Outstanding works include the installation of subbase base costs and asphaltic costs, which should commence in the coming weeks. Arm four, Mr. Speaker, Millennium Highway. Construction of the embankment is at an advanced stage, and in the coming weeks, we should see the integration 
of the roundabout into the Millennium Highway to allow for access to the bridge. Mr. Speaker, that is the, mo the most critical component of the project, the roundabout, which has to be constructed during, during while traffic is moving on the highway. And because it's a roundabout, there is a lot of relocation and temporary slipways which have to be constructed, for which the Ministry will be meeting next week to discuss the strategic move on the part of the contractor. Mr. Speaker, I move to lots two and three, which are the lots which were rejected and revaluation undertaken. To facilitate the rebidding of these two lots, Mr. Speaker, they were subdivided into two smaller sub-packages, one each, in anticipation that a better market response would be received. The rebidding packages, Mr. Speaker, can now be identified as follows. Lot 2A, rehabilitation of the cul-de-sac Anslery Bridge. Lot 2B, reconstruction of Anslery Bridge. Lot 3A, Anslery to Canneries. And Lot 3B, Canneries to Sofre. Mr. Speaker, requests for bids for these four packages were issued in February 2022 and bids were received on April 27, 2022. The evaluation report has been completed and submitted by the Project Management Unit to the Caribbean Development Bank for its no objection. Mr. Speaker, it is therefore anticipated that once the CDB grants its no obje objection to the Project Management Unit, a request for an award for the various packages will be submitted to the Central, Central Public Procurement Board, formerly known as the Central Tenders Board for determination. The project management unit anticipates that the awards for contract can be made early in the month of September. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker this government has been accused on a number of occasions of halting projects. But I, I, I oblige to state that the style and the DNA of this inclusive, people-focused and patriotic government is one of due diligence, transparency, accountability, and intolerance to corruption and wrongdoing. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this government, this government continues to labor in the vineyard of the people and we shall, on our promises, deliver. I thank you. Papers to be laid. Mr. Prime Speaker. Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following paper standing in my name. Starter instrument number 96 of 2022, of 2022, legal profession eligibility, Douglas Leonard Men's order. Starter instrument number 100 of 2022, excise amendment of schedule number one, number 10 order. Minister for the Public Service, Home Affairs, Labor and Gender Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I present these papers standing in my name. Statutory instrument number 97 of 2022, Immigration Prohibited Immigrant Order. Statutory instrument number 98 of 2022, Passport Fees Amendment Regulations. Minister for Commerce, Manufacturing, Business Development, Cooperatives, and Consumer Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to present the following paper appearing on my name, and that is statutory instrument number 99 of 2022, price control amendment number 12, order. Bills, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Development, and the Youth Economy. Mr. Speaker, I beg to present for first reading a bill shortly entitled Security Interest in Movable Property. Security Interest in Movable Property. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be presented for a second reading at the next or subsequent sitting of this Honourable House. Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I beg to present for second reading a bill shortly entitled Special Prosecutor. Mr. Speaker, before I present or commence the discussion on this historic legislation, I wish to express my condolences to the family of the late Speaker, Speaker Donald Alsey. Who was who presided over this house, and I wish to express my condolences to his family on his death. I also, Mr. Speaker, wish to apologize to the members of the public who suffered some inconvenience from the delay in getting their new e passports. There is any time there is change, Mr. Speaker, there is always some level of dislocation. And uh, I want to assure them that all those who paid $80 for their passport before the 25th of July, they will not be asked to pay anything more than the $80 that they paid previously. And also, Mr. Speaker, the passport that they have presently can still be used for travel and can be still be used for other purposes. So if there is not an urgent need to travel, there is no need to want to change your passport now if there is not an urgent need or if your passport has not expired. If your passport has not expired, you can still use your old passport to travel. So there is no need to be on the lines if, you, if, there is, if your passport has not expired. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the, the minister and the staff and the people in immigration for making that transition to e-passports, making it. We are it's at, at the top edge of the passport business, and um, we hope that everything works as is customary, Mr. Speaker. So having said so, I am very pleased that St. Lucians have access to the e-passport. Mr. Speaker, in the election of 2021, the government that the people of St. Lucia chose, on its platform, there was a, a lot of a talk about good governance. And I want to quote from page 51 of our manifesto, Mr. Speaker. From page, and I want to quote, <clears throat> during my budget address, also in our, in our manifesto, but I want to quote today from the budget address, which is already a document of this House. Mr. Speaker, on page 51, in the run-up to the last general elections, my party committed to ushering in a new era of good governance 
with zero tolerance for corruption in the administration of public affairs. Mr. Speaker, quite apart from our core beliefs, our policy position was in response to an outcry for justice from, from the people of St. Lucia for the abuses which were being committed by the last UWP administration. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia had witnessed a massive decline in its corruption index global rating. Therefore, we promised to stop the slide and restore our country's reputation to good international standings. Mr. Speaker, good governance protects the citizens of a country from abusive administrations who use state resources for the benefit of a few at the expense of the majority. It assures that the government is accountable, transparent, equitable, and inclusive, and law-abiding. We cannot allow corruption to take deep root in the administration of government affairs and its statutory agencies. We know that corruption breeds inefficiency, illegal appropriation of wealth, wastage of resources, and disregards the interests and needs of the most vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, with this in light, we stated, we are at the advanced stage of preparation for enacting the relevant legislation to appoint a special prosecutor to conduct investigations into acts of alleged public corruption. And Mr. Speaker, this is the, this is the act which I have the honor to present in this honorable house. Mr. Speaker, we are not reinventing the wheel here. There have, been seven, there have been several acts of that nature in the region. The Special Prosecutor Bill in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, is based on the Jamaican Corruption Prevention and Special Prosecutor Act. The Jamaica Act promotes and strengthens measures to prevent and combat corrupt conduct more efficiently and effectively, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, that act was, was challenged in relation to the director of public prosecutions, and it was not successful, Mr. Speaker. The special prosecutor, also, there's a special prosecutor in British Columbia. It's called the Crown Council Act. In Ghana, passed in 2017, in the United States of America, and in Australia, Mr. Speaker. So we are not reinventing the wheel here, nor are we doing anything special to go on any witch hunt, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this act is not about a witch hunt. This act is about having St. Lucia as a place where corruption is not tolerated or encouraged, whether for politicians or for public officials. <laughs> This is the object of the Act, Mr. Speaker. The Act does in any way conflict with the duties of the Office of the Director of Prosecutions. But, Mr. Speaker, we know, and the Director of Prosecutions said himself that he's overwhelmed. He said that there are over 90 cases of murder in the system which he cannot deal with, Mr. Speaker. So if we Cannot, we cannot wait, Mr. Speaker. We cannot wait for the Director of Public Prosecutions whilst the very core of our existence is being threatened, Mr. Speaker, by acts or perceived acts of corruption, Mr. Speaker. And I turn to Section 8, the powers of the Special Prosecutor. It says, subject to the powers of the Director of Public Prosecutions under Section 73 of the Constitution of St. Lucia. The Special Prosecutor may perform any function in relation to the institution carrying on and withdrawal of a prosecution for an offense against the laws of St. Lucia or may prosecute a matter in his or her name. And under Section 83, Mr. Speaker, it says, the special prosecutor shall not withdraw a matter instituted or referred to him or her by the director of public prosecutions unless the director of public prosecutions consents in writing. 
So why says, Mr. Speaker, if the director of public prosecutions begins a matter, the special prosecutor cannot interfere. So the fear that the powers of the director of public prosecution are being diminished or belittled is clearly shown, Mr. Speaker. That is not the case as it is shown in the law, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, but we believe, it's our fundamental belief, Mr. Speaker, that public officials, and I want to I want to tell you, Mr. Speaker, what is a public official as is in the Act. A public official includes a member of parliament or a person having official duties under an enactment or a former public official, Mr. Speaker. So that means, Mr. Speaker, even if you are a member of parliament at, a, at the time and you are no longer a member of parliament and it's found that there is need for an investigation, Mr. Speaker, being a former member of parliament will not protect you. So f former public officials, that includes member of parliament, Mr. Speaker, are still under the jurisdiction of the special prosecutor if necessary, Mr. Speaker. And the, and the point of emphasis is if necessary. You, you, see, you see, Mr. Speaker, this government, we want to usher a new level of governance in this country. There have been too many accusations that have, go, that have gone on that have not been investigated. This is not a witch hunt, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you can't have a situation where government spends millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker, millions of dollars, and the people involved are not called to account for the use of that money. It's not legislation for, for us or for them. It's legislation to uplift the level of governance in this country. It is legislation that will make St. Lucia stand out as a country where there is zero tolerance towards corruption. And that is the mantra under which we campaign, Mr. Speaker. There have been too many instances, too many instances, Mr. Speaker, where public officials, where public officials have disregarded statements by technocrats. Statements like the cost of the silting a river was unconscionable. And there has been absolutely no discussion on that, Mr. Speaker. There are too many times where in this country, jobs that were, that were valued at $650,000 end up costing $3 million, Mr. Speaker, for the same job. And the public officials had the, the, the guts to use a local word to say this is unconscionable and nothing was done, Mr. Speaker. That cannot happen. That should not happen, Mr. Speaker. And all we are saying is that if it is found, and I want to make it clear, this is not a situation where we are going after anyone because this bill also pertains to us in this honorable house. It, it, it pertains to us. It, what we want to do is to ensure that the taxpayers of this country, that their money is adequately spent and not spent on enriching or making people other people's pockets, Mr. Speaker. Either for themselves, their friends, or their family, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to... I've, I've made it clear that the special prosecutor does not affect, does not affect the director of, of public prosecutions. I want, to, Mr. Speaker, to bring your attention to part one of, of the bill, Mr. Speaker, of the act, the special prosecutor. And it says, the Judicial and Legal Services Commission shall, in consultation with the Attorney General, appoint an attorney at law to be a special prosecutor. So that person is not a political appointee. He's appointed by the Judicial and Legal Services Commission. And Section 4 to Mr. Speaker speaks to the attorney at law appointed under sub subsection 1 shall have at least 10 years experience in the practice of law. 10 years experience. To be a judge, Mr. Speaker, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think you need 7 years experience. But in that case, to ensure that the official is of high repute 
and highly experienced, the law says that he must have at least 10 years in experience in the practice of the law, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Act speaks to how the special prosecutor can be disqualified. If he has filed for bankruptcy, or if he's declared by a court to be a bankrupt, if he's unable to discharge the functions of his or office, whether arising from infirmity of body or mind or any other cause, if he's found to have committed professional misconduct under Section 45 of the Legal Professions Act and is removed from the rule under Section 29, is convicted of a criminal offence, expect except if the offence is a minor traffic offence, or is spent in accordance with the criminal records, or is a member of parliament. So, member of parliament cannot be a special, cannot be a special prosecutor, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Act outlines the functions of the special prosecutor. The functions of the special prosecutor are to receive a complaint of corrupt conduct from any person and investigate the corrupt conduct. To investigate corrupt conduct on his or her own motion. To institute a criminal prosecution or civil claim. Criminal or civil. So that means he can ask for you to go to jail or he can ask for you to pay back. Criminal or civil. In any court against a public officer or public official, if the conduct of the public officer or public official appears to the special prosecutor on reasonable grounds to involve corrupt conduct, to prosecute a criminal offense or civil claim instituted, instituted by him or her in the courts, to prosecute a criminal offense for corrupt conduct referred to him or her by a director of public prosecution. That means the director of public prosecutions can ask the special prosecutor to prosecute a, a, a criminal offence if in case he or she doesn't have the time, Mr. Speaker, and to pursue, coordinate, and supervise civil recovery. <clears throat> the special prosecutor may investigate and prosecute a public officer or public official for a criminal offence or prosecute a civil claim for corrupt conduct committed by a public officer or public official in the course of his or her public office or public duties <coughs> under an enactment. And for this purpose, the special prosecutor is deemed to have the authority to investigate, institute, carry on, or do any other thing and then exercise any other function under this enactment, Mr. Speaker. And to do that, the special prosecutor will have a staff and the staff will, will be, could consist of attorney at laws, investigators, administrative and other ancillary staff required for the efficient discharge of the function of the special prosecutor. And the staff of the special prosecutor are public officers. It's important to note that, Mr. Speaker, they are public officers, the staff of the special prosecutor, Mr. Speaker. And the special prosecutor, if you look at section 19, it says, prior to commencement of duties, the special prosecutor, acting special prosecutor, attorneys at law, investigators, administrative and auxiliary staff shall take the prescribed oath or affirmations of appointment and secrecy. And secrecy, Mr. Speaker. Oh, Mr. Speaker, the Act speaks to the powers of the special prosecutor. And I've outlined before, subject to the powers of the Director of Public Prosecutions, on the sub substance sex, section 73 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, the special prosecutor may perform any function in relation to the institution carried on and withdrawal of of a prosecution for an offence against the laws of St. Lucia and may prosecute a matter in his or her name, subject to the powers of the Director of Public Prosecution. Where the Special Prosecutor institutes a prosecution against a person, the Special Prosecutor may withdraw the matter and the court shall discharge the, the defendant. The special prosecutor shall not withdraw a matter instituted or referred to him by her, by him or her, by the director of public prosecutions 
unless the director of public prosecutions consents in writing. And I'm, I'm repeating that, Mr. Speaker, because there are, are those who may want to create the usual mischief by trying to relate the director of public prosecutions to the special prosecutor, Mr. Mr. Speaker. It, there are two distinct positions, but if the director of public prosecutions institutes an, a criminal or civil action, the special prosecutor cannot, cannot stop it. Cannot stop it. So the director of public prosecutions, his independence remains pristine. He cannot stop it. Unless the director of public prosecutions consents in writing. There's, no, there's absolutely no conflict between the rules of the director of public prosecutions and the special prosecutor. Absolutely no, no conflict, Mr. Speaker. The special prosecutor may, with the approval of the Attorney General, engage on the agreements in writing persons having suitable qualifications and experience as consultants to perform service for special prosecutor. And Mr. Speaker, there is nothing new in that, Mr. Speaker. You've heard about these exorbitant legal fees that have been charged. And Mr. Speaker, there are more legal fees that have been considered. There are legal fees that are being considered, Mr. Speaker, and I hope, and I hope that this Honorable House, those who have the information, will tell this, the people of this country why were these legal fees so exorbitant and who promised to pay what, to who, and how much. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the special prosecutor is deemed to have the powers of the director of public prosecution under enactment except for the powers exclusively given to the director of public prosecution under the, conduct, under the constitution of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the act speaks to the duration of the appointment. The special prosecutor holds office for a period not exceeding five years and is specified in the instrument of his or her appointment. The special prosecutor may resign his or her office by written notice to the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, Mr. Speaker. There is provision for the appointment of an acting special prosecutor, Mr. Speaker. The Act speaks, Mr. Act speaks in Section 13 to the removal of the special prosecutor. And it says, the special prosecutor may be removed from office for inability to exercise the functions of his or her office without arising from infirmity of body or mind or another cause or for misbehavior, Mr. Speaker. The special prosecutor shall be removed from office if the question of his or her removal from the office under the subsection one is referred to the Judicial and Legal Services Commission by the Attorney General for investigation and determination and if subsequent to the investigation, the Judicial and Legal Service Commission recommends to the Permanent Secretary and Ministry responsible for the public service that the special prosecutor must be removed, Mr. Speaker. So there's a whole series of processes, Mr. Speaker, in which you can remove the, the, the special prosecutor. A whole series of processes, Mr. Speaker. Well, the question of removing the special prosecutor has been referred to the Judicial and Legal Services Commission under this section, and the Judicial and Legal Services Commission advises the Permanent Secretary and the Ministry responsible for the Public Service to suspend the special prosecutor from the exercise of his or her functions pending the outcome of the investigation, the special prosecutor shall be suspended. Mr. Speaker, it is not a willy-nilly situation. A situation where there are clear procedures, Mr. Speaker, because this is very serious legislation, Mr. Speaker. I've spoken about the staff of the Special Prosecutor Office as in Section 15, Mr. Speaker. Then we've spoken about, Mr. Speaker, the appointment of investigators, administrative and ancillary staff, Mr. Speaker. You see, Mr. Speaker, the Special Prosecutor will have attorneys at law working in his office, Mr. Speaker. That is to ensure that there is balance and also to ensure that the fees 
that are charged are in line with usual normal practice. But what if the staff, if the staff are in the office of Zika, then it's different with Zika. And I want to also say that if the staff are on contract, they are public officers. If they are on contract, there will be specific terms and conditions, Mr. Speaker. But as, but as, in, as is, is the case in the public service, Mr. Speaker, if they are public officers not on contract, their salary must be what is stipulated in the estimate of expenditure for that level of officer. That's right, Mr. General. That is, that is clear, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we spoke about the over secrecy, section 19, disclosure of interest. If this, again, Mr. Speaker, that is to avoid conflict of interest, to avoid internal, internal manipulation and inside the trading, Mr. Speaker. Disclosure of interest. The special prosecutor, acting special prosecutor, attorneys at laws and investigators shall immediately give written notice to the attorney general of a direct or indirect interest adverse to his or her functions under this act. So you cannot be judge, jury, and executioner. So you cannot sit as special prosecutor and you have an interest in the activity that is taking place. Or your brother has an interest. Or your father has an interest. Or your sister has an interest, Mr. Speaker. You cannot sit as special prosecutor. There needs to be that division, Mr. Speaker. Because when, when you decide that you want to go into public life, Mr. Speaker, you're actually making a sacrifice. And that sacrifice comes with obligations. You cannot expect to be in public life and want to be the same as someone in private life. You can't have... You cannot, have, you cannot have your cake and eat it. You must make the sacrifice that public life entails. You can't want to be in public life for power. You can't want to be in public life to, be, to victimize people. You can't want to be in public life to use your power and say, I did it because I could. You cannot want to be in public life and at the same time be in private life. You have to make your choices. And this act ensures that these choices are made. Public officials, parliamentarians must make the necessary sacrifice and exercise the necessary restraint and constraint when they are public officials. That is clear. So that means that if you entered politics, and let's say you had a minibus, and within that term of office, Mr. Speaker, you found yourself with what? A plane? No. And you found yourself within that term of office, you find yourself with a, a four-story building with, with an elevator. And when you entered office, everybody can see what you entered office with. Use me as an example. Everyone says, where I entered office in. I still live the same place. That's where I entered office in. Anybody can see. But if you enter, and after four years, before you were there, you had a minibus. And because you know how to use money, after four years, Mr. Speaker, you have these vivid signs of wealth. Somebody should ask you, where did you get that money from? We're not saying that you stole it. We're not saying that you got it through any legal means. All we're saying is that if you are public official, if you are parliamentarian, you must be able to account for where your wealth came from if you do not come, if you do not enter politics with it. That's all we are saying. That's all we are saying, Mr. Speaker. So what we're saying? is that bill will ensure that if there is a complaint, if somebody says that this public official told me 
and he can prove to give me this contract <clears throat> and put on this contract something for me. Put on this contract <clears throat> something for me, for my personal use, Mr. Speaker. This act says that if it is proven, that person, if it's proven, Mr. Mr. Speaker, on the part two, it says a public officer or public official shall not engage in corrupt conduct. A public officer or public official who contravenes subsection one commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of $300,000 or to imprisonment for a term of five years or to both. On conviction or indictment, to a fine of $1 million or to imprisonment for a term of 10 years or both, Mr. Speaker. Last week in this Honorable House, we increased the penalties for firearms and firearm offenses. This week in this Honorable House, we are increasing the penalties for the offense of corruption against the state of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, the, Mr. Speaker, the act further, and that is very important, because we know about threats of threats that have been made to public officers and have been made to civil servants and have been made to officials. I'm the boss. If you talk, you know what will happen to you. Keep quiet. I say do it. Do it, whether it's right or wrong, Mr. Speaker. This act makes provisions for how a complaint is taken to the special prosecutor, and it protects people making that complaint. Because, Mr. Speaker, we live in a society of fear, of concern, Mr. Speaker. Many things that happen that makes people afraid to talk. And many times people tell you, like, since I'm Prime Minister, people come to me and say, this thing happened, Prime Minister. But don't mention my name, eh? Many, many times. Many, many times. Don't mention my name, eh? <coughs> they are afraid, Mr. Speaker. This act protects them, Mr. Speaker. So, <coughs> listen to how a complaint is brought to the special prosecutor. I mean, I want to make it abundantly clear. This law is there for us too, you know. It's not there for any one set of public officials. It is there for us in this honorable house. And every day I speak to my colleagues, uh, these laws are there for us also. The same way when the last government increased the statute of limitations, so it was? Yes, they increased it to indefinite because they were looking to get, some, they were looking to find something. They were directed at some people. They were looking to find something on somebody. So they, 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 they increased it. We never shouted. We did not say a word. We sat, we sat in this honorable house and we kept quiet and we said, I think the member for before South said, pass your law, pass your law. They came and they extended the statute of limitations to say that if you committed offense in one year, some of them said after seven years, it, it, should have been, it could have been wiped out. They increased it. They said indefinitely. So if, you're, if you do it in year one and they catch you in year 40, you're in trouble. We said nothing. We never complained. We never. The record will show. The opposition at the time never commented. We said, Member Ton Kibat Chenwea, Kibat Chen Blanc. So we did, we said nothing, Mr. Speaker. We said nothing. And I've challenged them. I've, I've sat in this Arab house, in this side, and I've said to them, if any of you have anything against me, bring it up. So, so there's no need for them to be screaming at the special prosecutor. Why are people screaming at the fact that we are keeping an election promise and put an act in parliament that affects us also. Why is there such a you and cry? 
Why before the bill comes into being, you want to ask me to investigate what? Your time will come. Bring a complaint and ask the president, do you have to investigate Mr. Speaker? Why, why the problems? Why the problems? <coughs> Section 25, complaint to the special prosecutor. A person who has reasonable grounds to believe that a public official or public official is in breach of this act, has committed an act of corruption, will make a complaint in writing. It says the process now. You don't make it on Facebook. You make it in writing. <clears throat> Under subsection one, the particulars of the breach or act of corruption, the particulars as far as known of the public officer or public official against whom the complaint is made. <clears throat> so if you're saying that somebody has a house in Canada or in Miami and you don't know how they got it, you need to be able to prove that on Avenue 1, 2, <clears throat> there's a house which belongs to a particular person and how did a person get the money to buy it. The co you need to be, be to have it with proof so when this report person, he will determine, he will determine the speaker. The particulars as far as known of the public officer or public official against whom the complaint is made and other prescribed particulars. It goes under section six, protection of persons making complaints. <clears throat> when a person makes a complaint to the special prosecutor under section 25, in good faith, and reasonably believing that the complaint made and any allegations containing it are substantially true, and in the circumstances, it is reasonable for him or her to make the complaint, he or she is not liable to any form of reprisal or any suit, whether civil or criminal. <clears throat> A person shall not, in the course of employment, take reprisal against a person who makes a complaint on the sub, sub, subsection one. <clears throat> so if somebody makes a complaint on the, a particular government and this government changes the access, you cannot take reprisals against that person. A person who contravenes subsection two commits an offense <clears throat> and is liable on summary conviction to a fine <clears throat> of three hundred thousand dollars or to imprisonment for a term of five years or to both on conviction or indictment to a fine of one million dollars or to imprisonment for a term of ten years or both. <clears throat> Under section 27, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> it speaks to the rejection of a complaint by the special prosecutor. <clears throat> the special prosecutor may on receipt of a complaint on the section 25 and after examining the complaint reject the complaint if the special prosecutor is of opinion that the complaint is frivolous does not pertain to a matter the special prosecutor is empowered to deal with under this act what it says Mr. Speaker that if the complaint is frivolous if somebody is like you know what, what do you call it Chimay Bon Laplace if it's a man, just Shime Paul Bolaplas. Bolawi. If it's a Paul Bolawi, Mr. Speaker, the special prosecutor can dismiss it as frivolous and dismiss it. So everybody can just say what they want. The special prosecutor can dismiss it, Mr. Speaker. It goes for the Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Investigation of a breach. When the special prosecutor decides that there's been some need for investigation, where it reads on section 28, where an examination of a complaint made on a subsection 25, or otherwise, the special prosecutor is of the view that an investigation is necessary to ascertain whether public officer or public official has committed a breach of this act or other enactment, he or she shall investigate the matter. On a section 29, on the conclusion of an investigation on a section 28, and when a special prosecutor is satisfied that the public officer or public official must be prosecuted for an offense under Section 24 or make an or under other enactment, the special prosecutor shall institute and undertake proceedings against the public official or public official or public officer or public official, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, then 
on the schedule, on the schedule, speaker, it determines what is called corrupt, corrupt conduct. And that section is very important, Mr. Speaker. What is corrupt conduct? Corrupt conduct in relation to public of officer, public official, includes soliciting or accepting an undue advantage for himself or self or for another person. <clears throat> performing or refraining from performing his or her public functions for the purpose of obtaining an undue advantage for himself or for another person. That is called omission, the sin of omission. If you decide that you're just not dealing with that because it will affect you or somebody close to you. Promising, <clears throat> offering, or giving to a person an undue advantage to perform or refrain from performing his or her official function. <clears throat> so if, Mr. Speaker, it can be proven that you promise a man you'll give him a contract to build an airport, <clears throat> and in return you will give him something, Mr. Speaker, the public prosecutor can investigate it. abusing his or her real or supposed influence to obtain an undue advantage for himself or herself or for another person. Abusing his or her real or supposed influence to obtain an undue advantage for himself or herself or for another person. <clears throat> abusing his or her real or supposed influence. So if you use your power, Mr. Speaker, your influence to, uh, to give an undue advantage to yourself or another person, Mr. Speaker, that is considered corrupt conduct. Misbehavior in public office, misfeasance in public office, fraudulently using or concealing property or another benefit fraudulently using or concealing property or another benefit, <clears throat> offering or granting directly or indirectly to another public officer or public official an article, money, or other benefit being a gift, favor, promise, or advantage to the public officer, public official, or another person for doing an act of omitting to do an act in the performance of the other public officers or public officials' public function. In other words, bribery. <clears throat> Allowing his or her private interests to conflict with his or her public duties or improperly influence his or her conduct in the performance of his or her public duties. Allowing his or her private interests to conflict with his or her public duties or improperly influence his or her conduct in the performance of his or her public duties. Offering or granting directly or indirectly to a person performing a public function in a foreign state an article of money or other benefit being a gift, favor, promise, or advantage in connection with an economic or commercial transaction for an act to be performed or omitted to be performed by that person in the performance of the person's public functions. Acquiring, directly or indirectly, property or resources disproportionate to his or her legitimate sources of income, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> this is extremely important and should be noted. Acquiring, directly or indirectly, property or resource disproportionate to his or her legitimate sources of income, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> this is very powerful legislation. It's a very powerful legislation, and I agree, it's powerful and serious, Mr. Speaker. And that is why there must be balance. <clears throat> there must be balance, Mr. Speaker. Public officials are called upon now to have the highest level of behavior. 
their behavior now is under scrutiny, Mr. Speaker. All public and former public officials, Mr. Speaker. And it means, Mr. Speaker, that may, we may have to look at the way that they're compensated. <clears throat> because right now, Mr. Speaker, we are saying that we have raised the bar in terms of behavior of public officials. We have really raised the bar, Mr. Speaker. And this legislation <clears throat> is revolutionary. It's taking a leap of faith in the conduct of our public officials. It is saying to us that this government will not tolerate any real or perceived level of corruption. <clears throat> and it's saying that anyone who has an idea or who believes that there is any corruption or inactive corruption, they have the right to report the person to a matured, matured, experienced, apolitical, special prosecutor who will look into it and decide what is right and what is wrong, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is clear, it is clear that we have, we want to be a shining example of good governance in the region. It's not a time for talk, Mr. Speaker. It's a time where we are putting our money where our mouth is. We spoke about corruption. We spoke about the elimination of corruption, Mr. Speaker. And now we are giving the public the means and the resources to investigate corruption. Anybody in the public can make a complaint once it's not frivolous and vexatious to the spirit. Anybody can make a complaint and it can be investigated, Mr. Speaker and we should find whether it is right or whether it's wrong, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this means that in government, we must embrace honesty, we must embrace accountability, and we must look as government as being a service, a service to others, a service to people. You cannot be in government and your main aim is to victimize people or to take or to get rich or to take advantage of people because of your position. You have to look at government as a form of service, a form of improving people's lives, a form of making people's quality of life better. <laughs> this is why you're in government. We're not in government, we are not to be in government to boost our egos. We ought not to be in government to settle scores. We ought to be in government to put people first. We ought to be in government to have, to ensure that people's quality of life improves, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, speaking about that, Mr. Speaker, this St. Lucia really belongs to, to all of us. And yesterday, and it amazes me, Mr. Speaker, when I see what people tell the world about St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker just because they want to score some level of political gain, Mr. Speaker. I come to a situation of crime, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, there was a post in social media of a 2004, on the opposition media, a 2004 posting. The 2004 was taken out, it was erased, and it appears that if the situation happened, it was happening now. Mr. Speaker, what, what gain? To use a phrase, ki gain, ki asa. <laughs> but this time it's not for computers. Yeah. I mean, why are you Bradley. just because, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, just because. Front fruit, you want to be on the front foot. Just, front foot. That's just, that now. just because, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. The quality of political discourse in St. Lucia has deteriorated to such an extent, Mr. Speaker. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing, Mr. Speaker. It's amazing. But, Mr. Speaker, it's time for us to stop the talk, and it's time for us to walk the walk, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, and for those who may say that the authority of certain positions is affected by this act, and as usual, we're playing politics, and we're saying that under section three, Mr. Speaker, it says, 
This act does not affect, I've said so before, I want to repeat it, the authority of the director of public prosecutions under Section 73 of the Constitution of St. Lucia. The Attorney General, it does not affect the authority of the Attorney General to prosecute a civil claim or to discontinue or withdraw a civil claim on behalf of the government. It does not affect the integrity of the parliamentary commissioner on the section 112 of the Constitution of St. Lucia. It does not affect the authority of integrity commission on the section 119 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, nor does it affect the integrity of the Financial Intelligence Authority under the Money Laundering Prevention Act. So it doesn't affect any of these authorities, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't affect this, any of these authorities, Mr. Speaker. It does not. I mean, Mr. Speaker, speaking about <coughs> misinformation and downright untruth, Mr. Speaker, again, there was a post in social media saying that we're increasing VAT today. Yeah, front foot, front foot. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, how is it possible for the government to come to Parliament today to increase VAT? Or last week it was, I had increased VAT already. My position on VAT is clear, very clear, very clear. I want to say today and now in this honorable house that this government has not increased VAT. We have not increased VAT and the VAT rate remains the same. I want to make it abundantly, and according to a friend of mine, pollucy declare, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, this act is a quantum leap, a quantum leap into good government, Mr. Speaker. St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, must become a beacon of hope in the region. A beacon of hope. Where those who wish to invest in the country should not feel close by any official who demands bribes to secure facilitation of the intended investment, Mr. Speaker. And talking about investment, Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to tell you that the interest for investments in Russia has increased, has improved, Mr. Speaker. You see for yourself. You can see for yourself, Mr. Speaker, if you drive, by Halcyon, Santos Halcyon, you see an extension going on to the hotel. I'm very pleased that extension going to be. It's, it's, it's been built now. It's been built now, Mr. Speaker. And we signed the hotel for Shozel. The member of for Shozel is very happy, Mr. Speaker. He's, he's very happy, Mr. Speaker. It's, and and no, no problem, Mr. Speaker. We're doing it now, Mr. Speaker. But the fact is, the fact is, the fact is, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, it is happening now. That is the, that is what's important. It's not a promise. It's not a promise. It is not a promise of $1.2 billion of investment to happen in the next year. It is the reality that as we speak, is happening now. And that, Mr. Speaker, is, is the difference, Mr. Speaker. We do not, again, Mr. Speaker, we do not wish St. Lucia bad. And that is why this legislation is, affects all of us, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, as we speak, there are people who make it their duty to not only wish, but to speculate and to predict bad for St. Lucia. Make it their duty, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased that my colleagues, my colleagues have agreed that those who put themselves up to serve the people of St. Lucia must do just that, to serve the people of St. Lucia and not themselves. Our politics in St. Lucia must not be seen as a path to get rich fast. It is morally wrong to think so. 
and to behave as if it was so, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, George Charles, our founder, our father, our hero, when he left politics, he was criticized for leaving politics poor. It is said that a politician ought not to leave politics poor, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we think that this is wrong. You should not get into politics to become rich, Mr. Speaker. You should not. No one sent to call you to get into politics. When you get into politics, Mr. Speaker, you must come understanding that it comes to sacrifice, Mr. Speaker. And this is what this legislation speaks to, Mr. Speaker. And Speaker, as Prime Minister, I intend to make my tenure in office a period where politicians begin to put people first, to be honest, to be accountable, and to be selfless, Mr. Speaker. That is what, that is how I, I want to be remembered, Mr. Speaker. I don't want to be remembered as a Prime Minister who gets involved in hostility and hatred and victimization and division and untruths and on peddling, Mr. Speaker. That's not how I want to, I want to, to remember, Mr. Speaker. I want to remember as a Prime Minister who tried to improve the quality of life, not only the physical quality of life, Mr. Speaker, but the quality of life of our mentality, of our state of mind. I only live in this country where St. Lucians feel proud of their country, Mr. Speaker. Where St. Lucians are proud to be St. Lucians. Where St. Lucians believe that colonialism was an evil. And that is why we celebrated Emancipation Day in August, Mr. Speaker. Where we are not afraid of our history. Where we believe our, we have to learn from the mistakes of the past and improve it in the present and make it better in the future, Mr. Speaker. When we leave government, we want to live a better country. A country when people will not believe that these politicians are crooks. A country where people will not say, where no politician will ever say, when I commit crime, I commit crime on my own. And if any of my ministers ever make this statement, I say it publicly. If any of my ministers ever say in public, when they commit crime, they commit their own, I will fire them. You cannot tolerate that level of ill discipline in your cabinet, in a cabinet. No prime minister, Mr. Speaker, no matter who the minister is. No prime minister should tolerate that level of largesse and say whatever you want and, and disrespect in parliament of people, Mr. Speaker. No, level, no prime minister should, and this prime minister will not tolerate it, Mr. Speaker. This prime minister will tolerate a higher level of governance. A call to serve, not a call to be rich. A call to make a contribution to the people of the country, not a call to make a contribution to your friends, your family. And this is why this legislation is serious legislation. It's very serious legislation. And each and every member of the cabinet and member of the party was warned that this is serious legislation, Mr. Speaker, very serious. And truth be told, each one of us, after discussion, we agreed that it was serious legislation. And we agreed. And we agreed to support it because our intention our intention is to follow the law and to improve the level of governance in the country. Our intention is for a child to want to say that I want to be a politician. And I want to say that all these politicians are, you know what they say about some politicians. It's a law that says that all politicians are not the same. That we are leading by example, Mr. Speaker. We are coming to this honorable house and define what is corrupt conduct in clear terms that everyone can read it. What we feel is corrupt conduct. This is what this government is all about. And, Mr. Speaker, I want to say that it's our, we know that when we leave government, we will have St. Lucia will be a better place than when we took it over, Mr. Speaker. And that is our intention, to make St. Lucia a better place, Mr. Speaker. 
not fall in the same in the same malaise in the same lies and misinformation and and, and that we found it in the mr speaker so mr speaker i ask honorable members to support this act and i want to reiterate that it is very serious legislation it's legislation that speaks to governance it's legislation that speaks to moral moral justice it's legislation that speaks to transparency it's legislation that speaks to accountability it's legislation that speaks to us not depriving the people of this country because we want to make ourselves rich it's legislation that speaks to the delivery of goods and services for an affordable price and not for an inflated price to assist our friends. That's what this legislation is all about. Our politics must change, Mr. Speaker. The way we conduct our politics must change. And when the people of St. Lucia voted for us in July last year, they voted for change. They voted for us to change the way things are done in St. Lucia. And this act is the continuation of that change, Mr. Speaker. I thank you. Honorable members, the question is that the special prosecutor bill be read a second time. The member for Castries Southeast. Thank you, Belty Sasha. <laughs> Thank you so kindly for allowing me, Mr. Speaker, to speak on this very important and probably a very historical, progressive, and transformative bill, the Special Prosecutor Act. But before making this brief presentation, Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge and to salute a number of young ladies in St. Lucia who are vying to represent St. Lucia at the Miss Universe pageant. And in particular, I want to recognize Chrissy Manuel from Lacqua, the constituency of Castries Southeast. And just to inform the member for Castries South that while Castries um, Lacqua is on the high plain overlooking Ciceron, <laughs> and and for our show, we expect that the results will be in accordance with the plane at which Lapua is placed. So I know Chrissy this morning is listening as I told her that I would recognize and provide support that Chrissy Emanuel do well in this upcoming pageant to represent St. Lucia in... <laughs> also permit me, Mr. Speaker, to to acknowledge the, the belated birthday of the member for Central Castries and in a special way acknowledge the member for Castries South on account for, of the celebration of Emancipation Day. This, this was very much successful, Mr. Speaker. I wasn't able to attend due to some critical reasons, but I noticed the opposition was absent. And Mr. Speaker, I want to just pause here and say something about the participation when you're in opposition. Mr. Speaker, I recall vividly that while I sat on this side as leader in the Senate, that I was once approached by the, by the Thank you. 
I recall the President of the Senate, who was then responsible for the independence celebration at that time, approached me and asked me in my personal capacity to provide financial support because the government at the time was not able to meet the total cost of independence celebration. And as a patriotic St. Lucian sitting in the opposition side, I gave financially to ensure that the independence at that time was successful. So I'm always St. Lucian 100% of the time. Whether I'm in opposition or in government, I will always be a St. Lucian and I support it. And I do invite members of the opposition for when activities like Emancipation Day, this is very unifying and I expect all St. Lucians and encourage members from all sides to be part of such a grand celebration of who we are as a people in a collective way. But Mr. Speaker, there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, comfortable, nor popular, a position that is unlike the regular rudiments of parliamentary representation. But he must take it because conscience tells him it is right. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I stand in support of this bill the purpose of which is for investigation and prosecution of corrupt public officers and officials and for the appointment of this special prosecutor. But before going further, Mr. Speaker, I want to dispel the belief that is entrenched in the minds of many good people, both here and abroad, that all politicians are the same. Mr. Speaker, are all teachers the same? Are all police officers the same? Are all lawyers the same? Are all doctors the same? Are all public servants the same? Are all plumbers, architects, masons, carpenters the same? Are all customer service reps the same? Are all bank tellers the same? If they are, why do we crane our necks over the long queue to look for our favorite teller, hoping we are lucky to get him or her when our turn comes? It is because some stand out over others. It is because we are not all the same. And like a child's puzzle, if you don't accept that the pieces of each are different, you will not even search and inspect for the differences so you can solve the puzzle. And so we are not all the same. Mr. Speaker, some people sincerely and honestly believe that, but there are those who know the difference. And because that difference will not serve their purpose, they deceive quite a few by saying, all politicians are the same. Mr. Speaker, I want to be candid to say that I believe that all politicians are confronted with temptations. An exhortation given by Father Patrick Anthony in the church service of the celebration of 25 years of service by both members of Castries East and Viewford South. But above any temptation is the fervor and passion to deliver the promises and pledges, including the investigation to, and persecution and prosecute corrupt public officers and officials as stipulated in the SLP manifesto captured in the social commentaries crying for justice and registered in the conscience of all uncompromised minds and hearts of St. Lucians, both here and abroad. Mr. Speaker, what has become of St. Lucian the prospects of good governance? Mr. Speaker, there are many stories out there that speak to what transpired. And one comes to mind, Mr. Speaker, because every time I recall moving around the constituency, there are persons who would share their experience while this government was in power. One such reminds me of a person who came to me and said that she was waiting for funds to pay 
Nine workers each supposed to receive $500. She was expecting $4,500. But in the night, in the night, she received an envelope of $9,000. And the night was not over that somebody else approached with another $9,000 and to say, I've already received the money. These were not, these were just persons expressing their views and some of them in disgust in terms of either they were not getting enough or they were feeling aggrieved that who else was receiving. Mr. Speaker, when I think of St. Jude Hospital, some of the DVRP projects, some of the CDP projects, particularly in Castries Southeast, I ask, what has happened to the prospects of good governance? Take, for example, Mr. Speaker, this project on the river banks with containers where we are building where a so-called market out of containers are being built. The concrete slab was built, the containers are placed, and the steel frame and every aspect of what's supposed to be a metal roof structure is on the ground. But there's no trace of the drawings in government. It doesn't exist in planning. It doesn't exist in the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And lo and behold, I came across a drawing in the community in the hands of someone who said to me that a so-called person who went up in the election was the one who did the drawing. And I asked the person who did the concrete slab, who paid you? Person said, not the government. I was paid by someone who was contesting the election. Mr. Speaker, I visited the accounts at the Ministry of Economic Affairs, and for the total amount of work executed thus far, that amount of work on the ground is not there. More than $200,000 worth of work have been done. The contractor has been paid, but only $50,000 was paid. Is it a gift to the people of Castry Southeast? What is it? And how do you continue with such a project? Mr. Speaker, I need to speak about another vexing situation. Footpaths. Mr. Speaker, people pour concrete all over and call it footpaths. And everybody believes that they can get a contract to do footpaths. Mr. Speaker, as a trained professional, footpaths have standards and specification. There must be risers no more than seven inches. Treads must be no more than 12 inches thereabout. You must have no more than flight, um, 12 flights of steps um, steps in a, in, a, in a staircase area, that the, 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 the landing must be of a certain width. Mr. Speaker, go to Bexo. Go to Bexo, and you will see a footpath, and I call it, excuse me, please, because two persons cannot pass on it at once. If you are not seeing eye to eye with your neighbor, you need to reverse, because there's no space for two individuals. You have, to you have to you have to move and you could you could go ahead and look at it being implemented by government how do you do this mr speaker and you add all of this up and you ask what is the value of the interventions that we are implementing mr speaker look at this 11 million dollars project in the river in Bexo, the board, the DCA board under the administration of the former government didn't approve it and gave 22 reasons in writing, yet the project moved on and this board again did not approve it. Mr. Speaker, it's being built under the Disaster Vulnerability Risk Reduction Program. Members on this side, can you imagine with intense rainfall that persons living across on the hill if they, they lose their homes will cross the narrow bridge to go into a safety area across there how would they get there would they cross the, the river that is coming down with all this turbulence 
Do you envisage somebody crossing the river to get into us into safety? So the selection site, as indicated by the chairman of the DCA, the entire board unanimously saying it is troubling how the worst part of St. Lucia for disaster, we must put in an $11 million disaster vulnerability risk reduction shelter. Rivers on both sides. Mr. Speaker, this is troubling. This is troubling. And more concerning for me, Mr. Speaker, and I will not venture into details in some of those projects, because I think the rights of the people should do so. But I must note, Mr. Speaker, my disappointment with the professional bodies of St. Lucia. The Architects Association, the Engineering Association, the Quantity Surveying and the Surveying Association, during the last five years, they remained silent, not a word. And in the context of the debate, Mr. Speaker, permit me to acknowledge the Association of Medical and Dental Fraternity when the COVID debate over a particular medication was happening. Notwithstanding, we may disagree with the then doctor, but ivermectin was the name. But of course, you see professionals arguing and debating. And any student in St. Lucia who would be pursuing medical studies would have appreciated the discourse and at least could, could say something about ivermectin. But Mr. Speaker, I haven't heard, I haven't seen on social media or anybody write anything about the atrocities taking place in the built environment by none of the professional bodies in St. Lucia, save Mr. John Peters, Mark Hennicott, only, only, Mr. Speaker, a, a wonderful bridge some of which you will only see in textbook is being built in cul-de-sac. I haven't seen some a professional write an article to edify the nation on it. Piles being driven almost 50 feet deep. Wonderful experience. Nothing to say about it. They didn't comment about St. Jude Hospital and that no one, sh it is customary to secure materials off-site. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, when this happened, when a, a politician will move on a site as if materials were being stolen, this, the professionals, especially the quantity surveyors, who continue to value works and include materials off-site in their payment certificates, should have written and said there was nothing wrong with the materials being stored there. Because, Mr. Speaker, when you're going to build a massive structure like a hospital, a lot of the materials, you do not have space to secure materials on site. And because of you, you're planning to execute your work in a timely manner, most times you need to secure the materials very early and you cannot bring it on that. One, you do not have the space to secure it. Two, they need to be stored under special conditions. But we made some business person look like a crook when there was nothing wrong, and the quantity surveyors who are preparing certificates of payments every day stayed quiet. And when they said the corridors at St. Jude had a problem, not one engineer or architect wrote and could have, you know, said something in the newspaper that Tapia Hospital was a hotel with narrow corridors and has been made into a successful hospital. It used to be, the, the corridors are narrow. In fact, if you take the elevator and go down into certain parts, it's not according to standards. There isn't a dirty and clean corridor as per international standards, but Tapio is where we pay most of our money to go to. You understand? Victoria Hospital is far more superior than Tapio Hospital in terms of design. Go and take a, take a look at the L block and look at the design of the theaters there and take a look at what obtains at, Saint Jude, at, at the Tapio Hospital. But we lick up St. Jude Hospital and everybody drank this old Kool-Aid 
as if it was correct. And the professionals in this country said nothing. I wish to register that my disappointment with them, and I told them I would come in this house and I would say this, for any country that needs to develop, and if we need to experience true development, the professionals that the, the people of this country have invested in must stand up and represent their profession at all times. We should not leave engineering to politicians. We should not leave design to, to, to politicians. There are times the architects, we can disagree, but they must speak and we ought to respect them. And maybe one of the reasons why they were afraid is the, the level of disrespect coming from the government side. I've heard some statements about professionals on this side, and honestly, it's not encouraging. The fact that we disagree with professionals, we must not characterize them in the way that we did. Mr. Speaker, I think we are, or we can, if we do not deal with corruption, we can only destroy this country. Why? Because we believe that it is safe when this thing happens. But Mr. Speaker, a man who steal from me will also who steal from me will also steal from me. A man who would steal for you will also steal from you. So Mr. Speaker, it is important that we listen to the advice from our Prime Minister as he presented this bill. Mr. Speaker, true development of the people must be holistic. It must be holistic in nature. It must include the development of laws and rules, education of our people, their personal development, therapeutic interventions, if you may, cultural activities, entrepreneurial development, sports and recreation, reintegration of our people after they leave borderless, but a strong rejection, rejection of corruption. Mr. Speaker, at this juncture, I need to remind our people that the Special Prosecutor Act or the bill being presented, while it is directed as public officials, our people who are supporters, it also directed at them. Mr. Speaker, very often we speak of the day that we won the election and the celebration took place. And we continue on the anniversary to celebrate the victory. But Mr. Speaker, until you change hearts and minds of our people, sometimes I ask, why do we celebrate? Mr. Speaker, some people have gotten used to this atmosphere of doing things the wrong way. Some people believe, and most persons believe, that they must get a contract. And they are not distinguishing between what is price, what is cost, and what is value. Mr. Speaker, I have said to some of my constituents that if you want a job, you must give your price. Your price is how much it would cost you to provide that service. But your price may be lower or higher than somebody else's price because it may cost you a lot more or less to do it. But some people, because of the budget processes that we, are, that we use, will go into the estimates of expenditure and see that a budget allocation is made for a road. And instead of preparing a price, the person will be given the budget estimate and use that to submit as the price for the job. And when the person implements the work, because it's costing them more, you get cost overruns. And for some of the other reasons that the, that the Prime Minister outlined, the cost goes up, or the cost need to be inflated. Mr. Speaker, we cannot continue doing business that way. Mr. Speaker, I've asked the minist my ministry, the account section, to purchase a tender box 
and wrap it with the government of St. Lucia logo and the departmental tenders board establish the rules as enshrined in the procurement and store rules and put the key at the Ministry of Finance. So when tenders come in at the Ministry of Equity, the officer from Ministry of Finance who sits on the department of the tenders board will come in with the key. Only then persons will have access to tenders. This is how serious we are taking the issue of tendering in the Ministry of Equity. And I have said that in the council in Bexor, there will also be a tender box too. Persons must get used to giving three quotes and allow them to understand the business of giving a price. Mr. Speaker, you know, the people in Castries South are wonderful people. And I love them. And when a senior person would call you to their home and tell you, Missy Amo Pasa de San Marshall, I've been where Paske Kwa And you climb to the person and you see the vulnerability, the person has reached the age where they're tired. And say, Missy, can I lack it there, Kaila, I'm of the contract, Paske, you might have to do it. This is an everyday thing in Castro's office. You're 90, you're 80, you cannot even get to the house, but you want a contract. And the contract must be arranged so that you will make a profit. So then the person never give a price. You tell the person to do it and arrange the price with the person. And if the person doesn't get the price right, then you now need to take responsibility. So what we have become. So I have to say no to some persons. I have said no. And I guess sometimes you get unpopular. I say, Mama pasa fesa. Mwe kai we do on lot money and me pasa ba o contract paske la ni lot mun kisa ba ya puipuli. So, Mr. Speaker, I need to remind myself very often of the children of Israel who escaped slavery in Egypt on their magnificent journey to a promised land. But whenever they encountered problems, they complained to Moses and said it was better in Egypt. Mr. Speaker, I expect sometimes that our people, through this journey of having good governance, will sometimes not understand what we're trying to do. But Mr. Speaker, we need to stand our ground because we don't have an alternative. We cannot allow greed and selfishness to take hold of everything that makes us hard-working, industrious people. We must strive to serve well. So, Mr. Speaker, it is expected that some people, of course, will oppose this bill for various reasons. Some only know justice for the powerful. Some will not recognize that corruption in public office prevent us from adding more persons on the public assistance. It reduces our ability to strengthen our safety nets. It makes medical assistance a greater challenge. It reduces our ability to give more scholarships. It affects us to provide more persons with housing assistance and impairs our social protection agenda. Some will not support because the lack of political maturity to unite on anything that is progressive when the party is not in power. Some will oppose because maybe the coffers are full and they believe that we are coming after them. Mr. Speaker, an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of his neighbor. Let's serve the people well, not only to avoid prosecution under this bill, or because we want them to return us into government, but also because it is the human and moral thing to do. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.
The member for Castries South. Mr. Speaker, I beg that this house be suspended until 2. Before I put the suspension, may I take the opportunity to make one of the announcements that I had omitted earlier. At the previous house sitting, I had advised that the member for Castry Central had in fact written to the speaker on the matter of privilege regarding the member for Meekwood South, and that I would have looked at the letter as to whether it met the provisions to be brought before the House. My initial reading of the motion did not meet that requirement, and I so advised the member for Castries Central, who resubmitted a motion, and that motion did meet the requirements, and therefore the motion to bring the member from Miku South before the Privileges Committee shall be placed on the order paper of the next sitting of the House. Yeah. Members, the question is that this House do sense this stand suspended until 2 p.m. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it sitting suspended. now um, being suspended uh, until 2 o'clock uh, this morning we started about 10.30 because of a few uh, problems with the broadcast um, when we started off this morning the papers were laid by the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Development and Youth Economy uh, by the Honorable Minister for the Public Service, Home Affairs, Labor and Gender Affairs and by the Minister for Commerce, Manufacturing, Business Development, Cooperatives and Consumer Affairs. The securities interest in movable property has been moved for second reading to a subsequent sitting of the House and um, the Prime Minister went on to present the bill for the Special Prosecutor. We heard statements by the Minister for Agriculture on the state of the banana industry. He said that they, when he last spoke to Parliament, the industry was in dire straits. St. Lucia recommends shipment of bananas to the United Kingdom. Uh, that's what he said. St. Lucia has recommended the shipment of bananas to the United Kingdom. He went on to thank farmers for their hard work in achieving this goal and said that the industry still had multiple challenges which this administration is sure will, under, will overcome. We also heard from the member for Cassidy's North, the Minister for Infrastructure, on progress on the work being done on the Millennium Highway and the West Coast Highway, citing a number of setbacks which has resulted in delays. Prime Minister Philip J. Pierre then introduced for secondary reading the bill providing for the special prosecutor. He was followed by the member for Castries Southeast. Uh, one of the major points made by the member for Southeast uh, is the lack of representation by certain professional bodies in ensuring malpractices are corrected. Michael Gasper will sum up in Creole. Merci Winston. Um, quand nous avons fini avec une première session qui est constituée la chaîne avec un TV, c'est plutôt discussion, c'était plutôt à sous ça avec le special prosecutor. Premier ministre, c'est lui qui présente à ces lois là, nous avons neuf là, et bien qui a une chaîne d'informations, il dit qu'il y a quelqu'un qui a une position là, c'est un avocat qui n'est pas mis, qui dit cela n'est expérience, il y a aussi une chaîne d'informations sur les lois là, avec manière nécessaire pour 
Jean, Jean saint lucie puis mes gouverneurs, comme ça c'était un poumètre qui lui-même a présenté un manifesto, ça c'est partisan étoile là, là il a eu élection, et avec ça c'est un poumètre qui gouvernement saint lucie a tient. Après, il présenté, nous donnons aussi, um, ça c'est monsieur, il y a un seul membre parlement qui a parlé à sous. Loi ça là, ça c'est le même parlement qui a représenté Cassius Office, Honorable Joachim Henry, avec qui il parlait, il dit un chai bagaille qui fait un constituency, et qui parlait bien sérieux, et qui, um, ça c'est une loi, il a supporté bien fort, avec qui a encouragé par Jean Saint-Lucie. Pour point, ça fait gouvernement, ça c'est gouvernance, avec ça, ça fait corruption. À nous gommer contre ça, et c'est ça qui était qu'à parler. Um, il s'est nous qu'à nous qu'à rester enfin, il y aura vie commencé à des et avec un MTN et puis moi et puis Winston qui a vu ici à pour bas um, information pour d'où exactement qui m'a dit à la capacité. Well, like Michael said, we'll be back here at two o'clock to continue the debate on the introduction of the second reading entitled Special Prosecutor. Until two o'clock, this is Winston Springer on behalf of Michael Gasper and the National Television Network saying we're taking a break at the moment. Stay tuned. <laughs>